go ahead. Hi, thanks, Melody. Uh, I first want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. Um, we're very excited for our guest speaker today, um, Dr. David Mace. He's Vice President and Medical Director for McKesson Corporation, um, and he's here today to talk about accountable care organizations. Um, before I turn it over to him, I just wanted to mention a couple housekeeping items. Um, we are going to record today's webinar, and we will be making it available uh, to everybody who have registered today, and we will also be um, handing out the slides. And then at the end, we will be taking questions over the phone, so please stick around, and, um, and we'll queue up questions at the end. Um, but with further ado, I will pass it off to Dr. David Mace. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, pleased to be here today and pleased to be able to speak to each of you who have joined us on this webinar. Um, today, I'm going to review accountable care organizations. And specifically, I'm going to walk through why there's been this interest in the concept of accountable care, talk a little bit about the accountable care organization, which is a new contracting vehicle from Medicare, and uh, one that many private insurers are mimicking, and then talk about some of the basic aspects of accountable care, what are the things that are to be done within accountable care, and its relationship to the patient-centered medical home. What does it mean for specialty care versus primary care practices? And then end up with a few points around technology and its role in accountable care. So with that, we'll get into the discussion, and uh, uh, hopefully at the end we can have time for a few questions. So uh, start off with some just general landscape. Why are we talking about this? We know that it's about money. Healthcare costs continue to rise not only in the United States but also in other Western countries at a rate that far exceeds the consumer price index. The graph on the left shows you how the United States particularly has an accelerated rate above the consumer price index far more than other Western countries, but all are in the same boat in terms of uh, its rapid rise. If we look on the right-hand side, where it's adjusted for the gross domestic product of each country, we can basically case mix for each country and see that the United States has a particular problem around out-of-control costs in health care. We also know that the variation in care, why certain doctors and why certain hospitals do, thing one, do things one way in one place and do things another way in another place, is quite uh, rampant. Uh, this a picture from the Dartmouth Institute who has provided leadership in this unexplained variation issue for quite some time shows this threefold variation just in spending. If you just look at money in terms of one area to another, and as many of you know, Elliot Fisher at Dartmouth started out his work in unexplained variation in care by looking on one side of the Green Mountain in Vermont versus the other side of the Green Mountain in Vermont to show a three- to four-fold difference in cesarean section rates and could not explain it by any demographic mix or any other patient characteristics, only by the choice of the doctor in terms of how they decided to proceed with care. So when we talk about health reform, meaning how do we address this huge variation, unexplained variation in quality and rapid rise in costs, there are three basic aspects that people use to think about how do we restructure health care so it's a more rational system. One is coverage for all, always brings up political implications, but we actually cover everybody currently. We just do so in an inefficient insurance market. What do I mean by that? Well, we have a variety of private covers, and then we have a safety net of private Medicaid, Medicare, and other forms of public coverage. But even for the uninsured, which is a very large population and growing, those people are, in essence, covered as well. And when they show up to the emergency room in the hospital, they through our taxpayer dollars and a variety of tax incentives as well as uncompensated care payments made from the federal government receive the care that they need when they finally need it in a very inefficient way, albeit at the very last point of decompensation of their care. So we have an inefficient insurance market and the idea of covering everyone in a more rational system so you can't move payments or dump payments from one place to another is the reason for covering more people. We also know that we need to change the way we pay for care, and in particular, and this is the most important aspect, we need to strengthen primary care in this country. We know from well over 50 years of documentation, looking at county to county, state to state, or country to country, that those areas that have a higher per capita of primary care practices have 
better health of the population, better care overall that's delivered, and more importantly, lower costs. So better outcomes, better quality of care, lower costs. And those that have a low per capita penetration of primary care, states where we see a high penetration of hospital and specialists, we see the opposite. High costs, poor quality indices, and actually less patient satisfaction. So we need to figure out a new way to pay for care. We need to pay for value in addition to strengthening primary care instead of volume, pay for that care that has good outcomes, and we need to align the incentives so that everybody is working together as a team, hospital, pharmacy, nursing home, primary care practice, patient, caregivers, as opposed to operating in stovepipe vacuums with bits and pieces of the information, not knowing what the other players are doing. This is particularly true for those with chronic conditions, and those with chronic conditions, as we know, drive the vast majority of our costs in the country. And last, and not, at least not as important by any stretch, is the leveraging of health information technology. Healthcare is way behind other industries in being able to adopt health information technology. We can book our hotel or airline online. We can move our seats around. When we go, they know who we are. All the information is there. It follows us wherever we go. And yet, in healthcare, that's not leveraged to anywhere near that extent. So leveraging health and information technology, bringing healthcare into a more contemporary environment is the third leg of the stool, if you will. So next, a little bit about accountable care. Accountable care is a term that's currently being used as in essence, a proxy for the desired outcome of healthcare reform efforts. When healthcare providers and patients are accountable for their care together, we see high quality care and low at the best possible cost. And that's what we mean by accountable care. But to achieve accountable care requires physicians, other caregivers, and patients to change how they think about care delivery and how they work with each other with other providers and with payers in a more collaborative way. Key elements in achieving that care are significant care coordination between providers and patients, the ability to collect and share information across caregivers and patients. So everyone has the same information operating off the same page and they have it when they need it. Most importantly is being able to understand how you're currently performing, either at the level of a physician a primary care practice, or a more system view like an accountable care system or accountable care organization, or a health system, a hospital who perhaps owns or contracts with primary care and specialty care has pharmacies involved as well. Being able to measure your performance so you can identify where your gaps are and where your areas of underperformance are down to the level of a practitioner or a clinic or a hospital unit in order to therefore invest in improved performance in that area as an overall approach toward being accountable. And shifting to a primary focus on the patient's health and care outcomes rather than the current payment schema we have in this country, which pays for doing as many activities that are on the fee schedule as possible, particularly those that result in a greater reward of money, MRIs, NMRs, hospital inpatient space, et cetera. So we know from accountable care that a variety of models can emerge, integrated delivery systems or health systems who purchase practices or contract with practices, hospital and local physician collaborators, maybe a multi-specialty clinic or a, a primary care network. All of these entities can survive and will evolve, but most importantly, they need that operational infrastructure in order to become accountable. And they also need to collaborate with payers. Remember that building block slide, one needs to figure out how this new way of delivering care, the accountable, coordinated way, will be paid for, and therefore incentives and payment schemas need to be redesigned to focus on rewarding, paying for the additional value, rewarding the improved care, keeping the population healthy, as opposed to paying for going into the hospital or having lots of specialty care, creating efficiencies that reduce the overall cost of care. In healthcare policy circles, and Don Berwick in particular is head of the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, they refer to this as the triple aim. Better care, more improved care, more evidence-based care, uh, more high-quality care, better health, 
thinking about the health of the population and improving the overall health of the population or of the patient. And lower costs, reducing the per capita cost of health care overall for communities and for our country at large. So when we look at the Affordable Care Act, we know that there are a myriad of provisions, simply a myriad of provisions in the uh, Accountable Care, the Affordable Care Act, the, the, um, the health care legislation, as people refer to it, that strive to achieve more accountable care. Some people refer to this as throwing spaghetti on the wall. We knew lots of different approaches that presumed to have high value, didn't know how to put it all together, so they all got just put into the act, and they are becoming live through a variety of regulations and initiatives that are paid for in order to test each one or begin the implementation and then later spread it across the country as we see more successes. Here are a few. The Advanced Primary Care Pilot Program, which is really a patient-centered medical home program, was launched with eight states, and they are now looking at early results, thinking about expanding it. Community care transition uh, teams that the regulations are now out about. Hospital-acquired conditions, which is really a penalties program, penalties for readmissions, penalties for hospital-acquired infections, so on and so forth. Again, this slide is just a few of the many delivery system pilots and payment system pilots, as well as new contracting vehicles that are being unleashed over the next five years as a result of the Affordable Care Act. So there are these three independent areas of transformation uh, that I would reconceptualize, taking the insurance part out, as thinking about the way we deliver care, care delivery reform. In order to do that, one has to pay for care different, right, because people, providers, uh, pharmacists, hospitals aren't going to do something different if it's not paid for. So thinking about paying for care, payment reform. And then lastly, leveraging health information technology, which really can enable all of the above, right? Health information technology in and of itself doesn't do something. It enables better access, better coordination. It enables new methods of paying for care, tracking for care, reporting on care, and uh, connects people to uh, be able to coordinate care better and deliver care differently. I sort of think of the uh, health information technology as laying down the superhighway construct for the country. Health IT provides the ability to integrate providers across multiple care centers and support the complexities that are inherent in various proposed accountable care organization or ACO care delivery models, as well as new and complex payment systems such as bundle payment and global payments and virtual capitation and partial capitation and so on and so forth. Many of these different types of delivery models, ACO, if you will, or payment reforms are being um, brought forward by different payers, by different states, by different uh, federal pilots uh, across the country. And this is an important construct is that health information technology can really lay the fabric for them. And it does that by achieving clinical integration. Clinical integration of all the practices and the other healthcare providers and facilities that it really can empower the group to act as a team, including the patient or caregiver, by exchanging health information, by providing workflow support, uh, by giving back the information about how performance is doing and where the gaps are, and also thinking about how can I get best decision support, evidence-based decision support, and helping me as a patient or me as a provider or us as a team in making decisions. Uh, and having that information to support us in making those decisions at the point of decision-making, often in a care setting, but not always, often after leaving a care setting when at home. The patient and their family must be included in this perspective. Care delivery reform, as opposed to health information technology, really speaks to reforming the way we deliver care by aligning all the entities in care, having physicians and specialists and hospitals and pharmacies and nursing homes have the regular and timely transfer and exchange of pertinent information, medical history, medication list, problem list, lab results, and so on, so that the transition of patient care between settings or providers is done so seamlessly and also with the same information, including the patient, so that everyone is on the same page about the plan of care. In terms of performance management, another key aspect is the only way you can improve what you do if you're 
clinically aligned and thinking about delivering care different and it's being paid for differently, is being able to evaluate, is what I'm doing making a difference? So first and foremost is role clarity and responsibilities of members in the team, right? So the team could be in a practice, right, a doctor, a nurse, a health coach. It could be in a medical neighborhood, right, those outside the practice, the specialist, the pharmacist. Being very clear if they're connected and sharing information about what their various roles are in, re in regard to patient care. So there has to be that mutual understanding in terms of how they're delivering care so that the patient can join in and be part of the team as well. Being able to report back in terms of how the patient's doing, how the providers are doing, and more importantly, how the care is being delivered. Is it evidence-based? Is, is it continuous? Is it good medication adherence? Is there good outcomes at every level of a system of care? Whether you're talking about an ACO with the hospital and the nursing home and the practices, or you're talking about an individual physician or hospital department, you want to be able to know how the performance is and whether or not what you're doing different is making a difference. Unit utilization management, care management, disease management, and care planning are all aspects of how one would do that in a greater system of care. And these principles can also be lever leveraged in a practice setting as well. So, I want to speak about the patient-centered medical home. Patient-centered medical home, or patient-centered primary care, is not same old, same old primary care. Our current fee system uh, in America has seen over many decades primary care become more and more marginalized, giving less and less reimbursement for doing less and less activities, and yet having more and more responsibility. And the only thing that the medical home practice can focus on is what they're paid to do. They are running a business. So the fee schedule, in comparison to specialty care or hospital care, has seen an enormous gulf arise between it. And the expectations of what is on the fee schedule is that in which very little time can be spent with a patient just for responding to acute problems with less of an ability to focus on a more holistic view, a continuous view, providing coordinated care, and certainly not providing case management and disease reg registry management of population health, and so on and so forth. So a patient-centered medical home is a revitalized, robust, contemporary, and continuous form of primary care in which one of the key points in having this to occur is the additional value of this new form of care has to be paid for, right? Because people are not going to do things in their spare time that require enormous work. So um, the adoption of electronic information systems using this more population health management approach toward those with serious and chronic illness, uh, having continuous comprehensive and coordinated care across the care continuum for those members of the practice, putting the primary care practice in the quarterback role, are new additional activities of the patient center of primary care that would need to be supported financially. In addition, thinking about using technology to deliver evidence-based medicine and engaging the entire practice team in the philosophy of continuous quality improvement, cutting reports and looking at individual uh, patient outcomes and having graphs on the wall about access to the clinic and satisfaction and so on and so forth, and then looking at doing new activities that have an impact on that performance. That concept of continuous quality improvement is a team-based culture change uh, for patient-centered medical homes to engage upon, and we're starting to see that across the land. Extended access to care is probably first and foremost for patients who want to be able to reach their practice, their doctor, as, uh, as any particular need arises. So, being able to schedule at their convenience, being able to ask a question after they leave an appointment because they forgot something or because they weren't quite sure what the instructions were. These are things that can be handled by secure email exchange and other technologies that don't have to require the patient calling and getting another appointment or if they need an urgent appointment to be able to get in that day. Sorry about that. So, I've said it several times, we have to think about paying for care different, paying for the additional value in the patient-centered medical home or even any form of accountable care. And I mentioned a few of these before, but 
they all have to do with moving away from paying for doing more things, especially expensive things, to paying for higher quality, again, that triple aim, right, better health, better care, and lower costs. So this is the range from, and it's not on the actual schema, but all the way to your left off the chart would be the fee-for-service system that we now operate in. And all the way to the right, it's not on the charts, beyond global payments, is the concept that was tried without any other tools in the 90s of capitation. So a lot of these new ways of paying for care are in between the fee-for-service world, far off to your left, and the capitation world, without additional support, all the way on the right. And these are a few of the names. Each of them sequentially has varying degrees of accountability, which means clinical risk and financial risk for the care delivery system or for the practice or for the doctor. Again, as you move to the right, there's increasing performance expectations for higher quality care, reporting of care, evidence use, the use of evidence-based processes, guaranteeing access when and where needed, uh, having better consumer experience, uh, consumer satisfaction, but mostly the experience of consumers, any patients and their families and caregivers and the overall cost. And now we'll come back to the accountable care organization. Now, this is the term I was avoiding in just talking about accountable care. And the reason I do that is because the ACO, even though it's being used by a lot of people right now, hospitals who say they want to be an ACO or are becoming an ACO, or by a payer, Cigna and United, who is launching an ACO pilot with a, a, a payer, those are absolutely spot on with accountable care. But I reserve the term accountable care organization, for that that's embedded in the Affordable Care Act as a legislation which grants the Center for Medicaid and Medicare a new contracting vehicle above and beyond the two that currently exist, which is the fee schedule and the DRG system for hospital. Now, remember, the DRG is, in essence, a bundling of just the hospital care for certain disease states or certain conditions does not include the physician expenditures when in the hospital. So it's that sort of a partial bundle. This new contracting mechanism is so much broader than the DRG and so much broader than inpatients. Okay? It's a major change in Medicare contracting that is not available yet, but is supposed to be launched in January of next year. So the, um, the uh, uh, implementation of this will be... Uh, Varying across the country, the idea is that each contract with an accountable care organization, hospital, group of specialists, strong primary care, is going to be contracted for a little bit differently, but there are some general rules that are being released. And the interesting thing is, even though this is a new contracting vehicle that will be awarded to a number of health systems or physician networks across the country, Initially, they plan to limit it between 75 to 150 so-called contracts or awards, but they have the authority to begin to issue more and more contracts as they see fit or to expand the scope of the existing one over time. Now, the law, as I mentioned, requires a formal legal structure between uh, a network of primary care physicians or a group of multi-specialty physicians or between a hospital and a group of physicians. Always primary care has to be present. In fact, the ACO has to have primary care capacity to be able to manage at least 5,000 Medicare beneficiaries. Let me talk about that for a second. Primary care is really at the base of the ACO. An ACO will be responsible through having a, a, a group of providers for all of the care of a defined group of patients, Medicare beneficiaries. And that group that they're responsible for is defined by who their primary care physician is, meaning if um, there weren't any primary care physicians within the group that took Medicare beneficiaries, they would have no patients. So they'd have an organization with no contract. So, again, the definition of who's in terms of patient population is who is their primary care physician. So primary care is at the base and is a virtual necessity. It is the ACO in many ways with the other affiliates that could be in an ACO structure, hospital, 
pharmacy, et cetera. They don't have to be in, but they could be. It can just be contracted if they weren't in the ACO structure. Uh, really emphasizes the role of primary care. One of those constructs for reforming healthcare. So the ACO is a legal structure. It would have leadership and a management structure, and it would include having technology for clinical and administrative systems. It would agree to be delivering evidence-based processes of care and be able to report on those evidence-based processes, as well as data on cost of care, quality of care, and coordination of care across the system, as well as down to the level of practice. And in addition, there is a requirement that they deliver patient-centered care. More on that later. So, all laws require a regulation to be released to say, okay, what does this mean and how do we go about it? And the uh, Center for Medicaid and Medicare released the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking on April 6th of this year. Now, a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking says, hey, we're thinking about issuing a rule about this. What we want to do is come out a little early, tell you that we are thinking about it, tell you some of the ways we are thinking about doing it, because we want to get feedback as soon as possible from a, as many people in the country as possible as well. So these are a few key points from the notice of proposed rulemaking. We do not know whether the next phase of the game will be an interim final rule. Interim final rules, again, are subject to pub public comment in most cases. Uh, so we might have another round of this. And as many of you know, there has been a lot of pushback from a variety of stakeholders in terms of some of what CMS said they were thinking about in the notice of proposed rulemaking. But to summarize, the, the ACO requires processes that promote evidence-based care, patient engagement, reporting, performance reporting, and coordination of care. Uh, the ACO must provide CMS with documentation of its plan to promote these things, then evidence-based medicine, engaging the consumer, reporting of quality and cost metrics, and how they're planning on coordinating care. And there is a clarity on how patients will be attributed to being in the ACO, and I've already talked about that. They'll be attributed by who their primary care provider is. It'll be defined by how the patients walk with their feet. Right? So they won't be asked to pick a primary care physician. It will be based on looking at claims to see who are these patients actually going to for primary care services. Um, so in, in summary, the Accountable Care Organization is really an overarching structure in which many of those myriad of reform activities that I mentioned earlier that are in the Affordable Care Act can thrive. Right? An ACO, a hospital, a network of physicians, uh, strong primary care, which has to be there, uh, can work together to start thinking of new ways to be paid for care, like a bundle payment, new ways to deliver primary care, the patient-centered medical home, new ways to adopt health information technology or HIT, uh, secure email structure, electronic health records, uh, uh, all types of uh, technology innovations, automation in the pharmacy, uh, and, and other forms of payment, like virtual or partial capitation. So one question is, is since we do seem to be moving in a tipping point kind of way toward affordable care, who will actually lead the market? Will it be CMS and Medicare contracted entities? Will it be hospitals? Will it be providers? Will it be um, uh, states? I think the best way to think about it is could be any of those. But we do know that providers have to lead the way, right, because they're at the core of the ACO. In essence, much of this is really about how we take many of the accountability responsibilities that the payer has assumed for 30, 40 years, population health management, utilization management, care coordination, so on and so forth, and moving that hopefully in partnership between payers and providers to the provider so that at a practice level, patient-centered medical home, or a, a system level, accountable care organization, that those providers can then begin to uh, leverage that same approach to managing their population. So the people that we, the providers that will leave the market, and I'm using providers in a broad sense here, meaning hospitals, you know, contracted systems or uh, physician networks, et cetera, Providers that invest in technology for information management and reporting 
will be at the leading edge. Providers that assume increased performance and utilization risk will be at the leading edge. And providers that successfully implement patient-centered care, coordinated care, collaboration across care providers, and the use of data and analytics will be ahead of the curve. These will be the leaders in the accountable care movement. So that brings us to our next question. What, what are the requirements to be successful? Well, we talked about primary care, and we know the evidence says that better access to care results in uh, increased preventive care, increased uh, uh, evidence-based care, and decreases for uh, care that may could have been avoided with stronger proactive care. We know some of the key features of this are having a person who coordinates care, whether it's by telephone or by email or by face-to-face -face visits, and that targeted care, care coordination can involve assigning a care coordinator, a nurse care coordinator, or a non non-clinical care coordinator to specific cases, uh, which can help to guide patients, coordinate providers as a team, and manage transitions. The evidence says care coordination using team-based models has been shown to improve health outcomes and reduce costs. We know that leveraging evidence-based decision support can also help get us there by providing the right information at the right point in the clinical workflow to improve decisions and reduce errors and reduce redundancies and reduce costs. We know that targeted care management, right, focused on the highest cost patients, right, those patients that are nearing the end of life, that are having a train wreck, if you will, if you're also a physician like myself, of seeing patients with multiple medical problems, multiple chronic illnesses, who have not been engaged in coordinated care. Uh, and those patients who have chronic conditions who are worsening, those are the highest risk patients. Now, they may represent 20% of a patient population, but they account for 80% or more of the cost. And so assigning specific clinical care managers to them to target services and help develop a coordinated care plan so that they can find barriers to more efficient care and, and help resolve those barriers is another key important service. These care managers could be uh, members of the practice team or they could be a shared service provided by the payer or uh, by, uh, by some other entity or shared by a practice expense across practices. The key issue is they have to have a relationship with the members of the practice and with the patients. We know that many of the payer forms of population health management, utilization management using protocols to review and appropriately manage care services before they happen, like going to the hospital or having a certain diagnostic test or imaging test, um, can be helpful. There are, are guidelines like Interqual from McKesson or Milliman Care guidelines that help to do that. We also know pre-certification. Uh, providers often experience this as mother may I, but if they're in control of making decisions around, geez, you know, we really want to be notified as a primary care practice because we'd like to have a say into which specialist this person sees and whether or not it makes sense or when they're going to the hospital so we can help to advise the hospital about their care. These are the forms of, of, of ways that providers can pick up what have traditionally been a payer responsibility. And then lastly, uh, hospitals, once the patient's in the hospital, uh, being able to have the primary care physician team who knows the patient the best be able to help make sense and rationalize the care that's delivered is very helpful. Disease management, another form of case management in which specific disease states have, say, a group program for diabetic nurses or, a, a, say, a diabetic nurse specialist who's has their diabetic patients following them on Twitter. There's a variety of ways that disease management can be levered. Lots of tools and applications to really assist patients manage their chronic condition. Hospital or other healthcare facility care transition management, we know today few hospitals monitor their readmissions, and that results in a 20% um, uh, of patients who leave the hospital being readmitted within 30 days, of which half don't even see a physician during that time they are out of the hospital. In an ACO, we want to think about working across the system of care and coordinating it. So one day they need 24 by 7 nursing home, the next day they're seen by their primary care physician who is well aware of everything that was done in the hospital, was informed about it along the way, and is prepared the next day to see the patient or the next several days. 
And by doing this, we know we can really drop anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of these readmissions to hospitals. Medication management, we know that most medications, uh, particularly for chronic conditions where the costs in the healthcare system are, uh, are not well adhered to. Uh, and that's responsible for 33 to 69 percent of readmissions as well as much of the cost. And so leveraging the pharmacist through the patient sees, leveraging specific protocols by the care delivery system can really help to improve this adherence by engaging the patient and uh, resulting in less in adverse reactions and improved outcomes to the patient. This pharmacist role in the care team is so critical. You know, they are the most well-trained in pharmacokinetics and pharmacoanalysis. They mostly have doctoral degrees, and yet they're operating at nearly the bottom of their license by being on a corner, every corner in the country, just like a Starbucks, uh, and yet uh, just counting pills. So we need to engage them in the healthcare system, the accountable care system, and leverage them to working closer to the top of their license as part of the care team. And lastly, wellness and prevention have not been areas that we've focused on in the past uh, as a primary care physician because they're not on the fee schedule, right? So we need to, again, have that value supported but incorporate preventive strategies and, and, and population wellness strategies and individual patient lifestyle issues as ways to <coughs> avert the evolution of uh, impending healthcare problems for patients. And I'm going to say just a moment about this concept of patient care. I've patient-centered care. I've mentioned it several times today, but it really is a game changer. In the past, most of us, because of a long, multiple, multiple hundred-year history, uh, view the practice of healthcare as a, as a craftsman trade, right? Uh, it grew out of the Middle Ages where you could be a shoemaker, a candlestick maker, a healer, and as a healer or any of these other entities, craftsmen, you would get a shingle, a license, you would hang your shingle up and you would open the door of your practice. And your records would be unique to your practice. The quality of care would be based on the mentor that you learned from and the uh, way that you devise it to deliver care uniquely uh, and so on and so forth. But everything, the keeping of the records, the way you deliver care was all based around the patient coming to you and then saying, I'll deliver you my service. That's more of a practice-centric form of care. What we want to do is engage all the members of the team to thinking about the patient being at the center of care and uh, also involving and activate, activating them in the management of their own care, both. So we want the patient's information to be leveraged and accessible to all members of the community care team, and we ultimately want to be able to engage the patient in making more independent decisions, being more well-educated, and the healthcare team, both within the practice and the medical neighborhood, uh, can be uh, more responsive to that patient. It's a new way of thinking for providers that really bucks against uh, centuries and centuries of, of more of a practice-centric model of a healer in the community. I'm, I'm going to skip over this slide. I mentioned performance management. Data will be essential, so as we install uh, technology, we want to be able to leverage the data from claims or from the EHR and eventually apply analytics, the promise of analytics, to, to help better understand and get information out of that data. ACOs and practices that leverage claims data and laboratory and EHR data and patient satisfaction data will be at the forefront of performance management. So by leveraging technology and adopting these new approaches, one can begin to integrate care across the community in a more patient-centric way. Now, many of us have been talking about this approach, this population health approach. I think back in the late 80s and early 90s, when I first got involved with it, we were calling it health care stewardship, not accountable care. Uh, coordinated care, patient-centric care, uh, many different angles of what we're trying to get at. Efforts in the past have not been successful, right? Capitation in the 90s, managed care, and so on and so forth. You know, I'll, I'll even harken back to... Um, a presidential-sponsored committee report, the Committee for the Containment of Medical Costs, which delivered a report to the then president, uh, which said that we need to have stronger primary care. We need to pay for care different, so we're paying for value. We need to have more coordinated care across our providers. And we need to uh, 
uh, do so in a way that we're responding to patients' needs at the time they need them. That report was delivered to then President Herbert Hoover by the uh, Committee for the Containment of Medical Costs back in 1929. So we've been wrestling with this problem for quite some time, and uh, I think the Affordable Care Act was the next step up from a long history of steps to try to get our arms around it. So the question is, what's different this time? Well, the stakes are now higher. If you pick up today's newspaper, you can read about our national deficit. And if you look closely at the numbers, you'll see health care is, is, if not the, uh, one of the top two or three drivers behind our deficit. Uh, so the stakes are now higher for everybody, which at some point will force all the various entities, pharmaceutical manufacturers, hospitals, providers, payers, to the table to say, hey, we got to kind of work together to get our arms around this. I think that time may be now. We know there's a strong interest in health reform and uh, legislation and billions of dollars being spent, and the goals of that reform are much clearer. We have almost 30 to 35 years of population health science experience that came out of the managed care era. Uh, much of what's been tried around paper performance and utilization management and case management, what we know about where the cost drivers are and who are the sickest patients and who benefits from what, have largely been done in the payer side and the health policy side, but that science of population health science can now be leveraged by the provider community. We know that health healthcare lags behind other industries in the adoption of technology, and yet we can now rapidly, and we have an attempt to invest in this uh, through the stimulus packages focused on uh, the uh, meaningful use initiatives and health information exchange initiatives to get us into the 20th, if not 21st century, uh, for healthcare and the adoption of technology. Uh, we uh, uh, recognize the need to align physicians. Physicians need to be and have been uh, always at the table making uh, the quarterback decisions with the patient. Uh, and we, uh, we've learned in that population health science how to risk adjust uh, for population, something we didn't know 30 years ago. So how do we answer the question of what every physician when they get a performance report back or every practice or hospital says when they get a performance practice is, oh, wait, but my patients are sicker. We need to be able to answer that question in a scientific, statistically significant way, risk adjustment, because literally every, every person getting performance feedback always comes back with that response. We need to be able to show to what degree and how much and then adjust for it. Government now has a role, and they're offering incentives as well as penalties. They're using a carrot and a stick approach, and we know from the days of D.F. Skinner that a, a, a reward and a penalty system works best in concert, uh, particularly in a four-to-one ratio. I think that's the work that's come out of um, operant conditioning work in psychology. I don't know that the uh, federal uh, initiatives have focused on the number of rewards, the number of penalties, but nonetheless, coupling the two is important. We know that getting multiple payers aligned, right, so we're not having to do different initiatives for each patient that are covered by different uh, payers is also important. And we're seeing much discussion around having the same performance metrics uh, required and possibly the same new ways of paying for care at each community level by the payers that exist in that community. Uh, that requires a whole other talk about how that's coming along, but it, none, nonetheless, it, it's been quite obvious to at least me and others in the field that have seen this moving forward that that is the intent and is also moving forward. Care First, for example, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Plan in Maryland has reached out to Medicare given their high density of population in Medicare and said, hey, join us uh, in the same system of paying for care. Let's work together. That would give them 60, 70 percent market share in paying for care different. Uh, literally a huge bump up in the way they pay for primary care as a game changer if they can align payers. So accountable care really results in a paradigm shift from our patients or those who make appointments to see us to our patients or those that are registered in our practice or care that's determined by whatever they're coming with today to a proactive plan to meeting health needs with or without visits to the office care that's provided by a schedule time and the memory skill of the doctor today to care that's standardized according to evidence-based guidelines. Uh, today's care where we know that we deliver high-quality care because we can tell you, and we had good training, we had good bosses, good mentors, 
Uh, instead, it's it, in accountable care, it's by how we measure the quality of care and how we implement quality improvement to improve it. In today's care, patients are responsible for coordinating their own care and in accountable care, prepared team of professionals watching and coordinating care as needed. Today's care, it's up to the patient to tell us what happened to them. And in accountable care, we track the tests and consultations and follow up after each one immediately with members of that team, the practice, the professional team, as well as the patient team, right, caregivers, family members, et cetera. Get everybody on the same page. And lastly, clinical operations currently center on meeting the doctor's needs in the hospital and in the practice. And uh, I skipped over that slide, but an interdisciplinary team would take the approach around the patient, not around the doctor. So accountable care has the potential to impact stakeholders really across the continuum. If we were able to pull all this off, and it is sort of a moon launch, kind of like back in the 60s, we'd start to see improved member and employer satisfaction, uh, so payers would be happier, hospitals would have less emissions, or maybe Last day for hospitals, but those would be very targeted and then they'd be uh, very focused in having good outcomes and very uh, satisfied with the delivery of their performance. Patients would uh, be better and safer and, and less costly out of their own out-of-pocket costs. Pharmaceutical manufacturers would be able to have improved data from the system and know that patients are actually uh, adhering to their medication. We'd have a better tracking system with the technology. Specialists, although there may not be quite the need there is today, uh, would have more targeted referrals and, and would be able to focus on what they've been trained to do best, and the employer would have the overall better health care costs, more productive workforce, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm not going to go into many of the successes that we've seen in the landscape, but I will, and I mentioned uh, some of them, um, but I will mention there's been a lot of attention on Blue Cross Blue Shield of uh, Massachusetts, not Maryland in this case. I did, was talking about Maryland before Care First, but... Blue Cross Blue Shield Maryland used the global contract. It's a form of, uh, of virtual capitation. What I mean is they contract with a bunch of entities, the hospital and primary care providers, and say, here's your budget. We're still paying you fee for service, but if you leverage these additional activities um, that aren't on the fee schedule of coordinating care and managing care, and you bring the cost down, you get to share in that cost reduction, plus you get additional payments for your performance. And these rewards can be quite high. First year results were out a little bit ago. And in fact, my understanding from uh, my friends at the Protestant Journal of Massachusetts is that they will be publishing a New England Journal of Medicine today, I believe, if not tomorrow, uh, uh, additional results beyond this, uh, that where they're seeing increased prevention, better disease management, better outcomes, and reduced cost trend overall. So just a little wrap-up in time for a few questions. Uh, accountable care, all these initiatives in healthcare reform are really interconnected, right? Try to make the point that technology can really help to enable better ways of paying for care, and better ways of paying for care will enable having providers and provider delivery systems deliver care different. And, and that investment may leverage health information technology to see how it's doing, and this becomes a continuous quality improvement cycle. It really brings together uh, a more right-sized pyramid where hospitals, specialists, and primary care are working together, most importantly, because today this pyramid is upside down with primary care being at the narrow end on the bottom, uh, well, you know, helps to revitalize primary care, put it more in the quarterback role, empower it to uh, work together and quarterback with the patient across the system and allow hospitals and specialists to be more focused and targeted and better serving their communities in what they do within a more integrated and accountable community of care. So with that, I'll open up for a few questions. I believe it's uh, about eight minutes of, so we've got six to seven minutes of questions uh, time available. I'll turn it back over to Melody to uh, open up the lines. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question at this time, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you're joining using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Also, please record your name when prompted. Again, star 1 at this time for any questions. And we'll pause for just a moment. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, star one.
So while we're waiting for uh, someone to think of a question, I will mention that um, I have the great joy of, uh, in addition to working with our McKesson clients, but also with uh, hospitals, uh, specialists, uh, primary care providers, home health providers, payers, state governments. So I have the joy of going around the country and listening to people and going into what's different this time. It's quite palpable. There is a strong interest in us working together across sectors, even though there's skirmishes for sure, because when we're talking about money, uh, you know, uh, there are always skirmishes. Uh, but there is a strong interest, palpable interest in, in collaboration in trying to get our arms and doing this different. And there are so many different um, collaborative efforts around the country uh, going on. It's just it's quite quite striking to me who have been thinking about this for 35 years and uh, much, much more than I saw in the, in the early 90s. So exciting times around accountable care. We do have a question in the queue. We'll go to Patricia Inc. Hi, Patricia. Hello there. I'm from the Grand Island Clinic, and I'm just trying to maybe uh, simplify this or oversimplify this concept. But um, I'm I'm understanding that in order to be an accountable care organization, you need to cover 5,000 Medicare lives. Uh, we're a pri Okay, you want to answer that first? Well, I, I do want to contextualize this. Um, okay. So uh, you are speaking, I think, about the Medicare contracting vehicle entitled in the law, the Accountable Care Organization. I just want to differentiate that because there are lots of other payers doing things called an Accountable Care Organization, which are very different. Uh, not necessarily very different, but aren't, aren't the same thing. Uh, they're all good things, and they're all very similar. In the Accountable Care Organization statute, of which there is a notice of proposed rulemaking, that 5,000 minimum uh, is actually required in the law. It's written in the law for Medicare. Okay. So in our uh, situation, we're a multi-specialty group in a town of, a, of approximately 50,000. We have one community-based hospital um, that is actually a nationally owned um, uh, entity. And um, so what I'm thinking the way that this would work from that perspective is that the hospital would be the um, steering force or the, the the main body of the accountable care organization, and then the hospital would bring into the fold uh, the primary care physicians in this town, uh, the other family practice physicians, OBs, internists, and, well, pediatricians as that may apply. And then is it the hospital itself that would do the negotiating with either the government on the Medicare perspective or on the insurance, um, you know, third-party payer, um, private insurance? The hospital would do the negotiating on reimbursement or amounts of money paid for various disease states? So... Um the, the Medicare contracting vehicle will be awarded to an accountable care organization. An accountable care organization is a new legal entity with its own leadership governance committee, et cetera. There are requirements for what's in there, of which primary care is uh, an essential component. So uh, it is not the hospital. There could be a hospital as part of the ACO structure, or there could not be. You can have an ACO with just a network of primary care physicians or a multi-specialty multi-practice group. Uh, if you form an ACO without a hospital, uh, you will probably want to contract with a hospital as an ACO in order to send patients there when needed, but it doesn't have to be part of the ACO. Okay. So the, what, what we are seeing is a, a strong interest in these initial contracts that will probably be awarded in January, uh, that there is an investment that needs to be made that's quite in substantial in, in the accountable care organization, not so much in the structure, but in these activities I spent the day walking through in this house. Right, right. So, so that investment can be quite large. Uh, it can be anywhere from um, some of the early, let me back up, most of the ACO regs were based on the um, PGP, uh, the group practice demonstration project that was started four years ago which Marshfield Clinic, Geisinger, many entities were in. You can look up information about them. Again, some of them had hospitals, some of them didn't. In fact, the most successful one, I believe, was uh, did not have a hospital. 
Um, so, so I'm just trying to give you a sense, but in terms of that investment, you need a large enough group with backing, financial backing. Could be private investors, could be a payer. By the way, a payer can be a part of an accountable care organization within the structure. Mm-hmm. So it could be, what we are seeing is some of the payers with Cigna has been doing this. They've been taking some of their leading providers and, in, and in, in helping and in investing in them forming an accountable care organization. According to the notice of proposed rulemaking, remember the final rule is an out, payer could, a payer could be part of that governance structure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, people are saying, well, who's got deep pockets? If you got a big clinic with a lot of track record and investment dollars, could be that clinic. In many cases in communities like what you're describing, could be the hospital with the investment dollars, so they'll probably want to be part of the, the, the group too. Plus, hospitals traditionally have a governance structure and, and leadership, management leadership that can they can bring to the table to be part of the ACO uh, new entity structure as well. Okay, and if it would be the hospital, uh, you know, with with the dollars, the investment dollars, and um, the um, the uh, what do I want to say, the support in order to get something like this started, um, then do would the hospital necessarily purchase the primary care groups, or they would just could just be in a contract of some sort? Right, I see. So. Um, okay. The, the hospital will not be the ACO. The ACO is a separate structure. Could, okay. If the hospital is part, they may have be have the deep pockets, right? Right. They may be there. Yes. You cannot have an ACO without primary care. They have to be not only part of it, but as part of the governing structure. And there are requirements in the notice of proposed rulemaking about the representation that providers, primary care as well as specialty care, but physicians have to have a very significant presence majority presence in the governance structure. So the governance structure of the ACO is very different than the hospital management structure, although a hospital can be part of the ACO. Okay. I think I'm getting the concept now. And, and you know, I, I've actually delivered a separate topic on the notice of proposed rulemaking and et cetera, et cetera, but, you know, it's something in flux right now. This, this presentation was to give an overview of accountable care because I think as a concept it's critical not just CMS, private payers, sure. uh, NCQA, and uh, uh, people are just doing patient center medical home. These are all forms of accountable care, uh, but your questions are excellent okay. and uh, and really deserve uh, a more specific uh, tracking of the evolution of these in- individual payer initiatives as well as the uh, federal regulations as they evolve. And remember, the feds are only going to initially uh, issue 75 to 150 of these across the country, the idea is they want to get some uh, track record with them before expanding it the following year, presumably. They've also issued some other, in that myriad of different provisions for accountable care, some other things like Pioneer ACOs, there's regs for Medicaid ACOs, so this is an evolving picture for sure. So I don't want to get too locked up in the specifics around the notice okay. of proposed rulemaking. Okay, very good. Thank you. Sure thing. Now, do we have time for another question? We do. We'll go to Taylor. Hi, Hi. Actually, my question, I just received my answer, so I'm all set, but thank you very much. I did oh. receive my answer. <laughs> no, no, no. Thanks for attending. Much, much appreciated. Definitely. It was, it was wonderful. Thank you very much. We do have another question in the queue. We'll go to Dwight Cohen. Hi, Dwight. Um, hi. Um, from the physician group side and trying to kind of understand how ACOs might come down, uh, it looks like McKesson Practice Partner Software usefully supports a lot of the patient-centered medical home and the concepts you have in ACO. The piece that probably needs a little more help is the care coordination. I've seen other software that has a strong emphasis on care coordination but doesn't have all the EMR, EHR components that Practice Partners does. Do you see that the small physician groups have the opportunity to possibly be an ACO, or is it is it always going to be a part of a larger structure that comes from outside the primary care? Well, so uh, you cannot have a larger the, the, the ACO is defined by the primary care practices, period. You can't have an ACO. They are defined by, because the patient population is defined by who their primary care practice is. So whether the hospital owns those practices or contracts with them or they're standing in the clinic or standing in the community by themselves and they form their own ACO, it doesn't matter. 
An ACO doesn't exist with just a hospital. It has to be and is defined by the primary care practices and their members. So with that said, um, you know, we are seeing different types of models evolve where uh, primary care uh, forms separate entities or collaborates between small practices, what, what you're talking about small and affiliated practices, where they either band together or are contracted together to form this more robust uh, network of primary care practices that forms the foundation, uh, foundational requirements of any ACO. But primary care defines the ACO. ACO cannot exist without primary care practice. In our area, hospitals are buying up primary care uh, groups right and left. Is that a move toward this? So um, that was a, the concept of hospitals buying practices. Certainly that happened back in the 80s, late 80s and early 90s, and then uh, reversed itself. Uh, has a number of different uh, underpinnings. It started about two years ago, and the trend continues to escalate. Um, in many ways, hospitals are now, many hospitals are refocusing on that, saying, geez, you know, I, I, maybe I better invest in these practices because they're required to form an ACO, right? Um, but it's, it's, you know, many, many uh, of the federal agencies have said they're not interested in seeing um, accountable care organizations with just owned physicians within a hospital system. So we don't know how this will play out. But there really is an effort to have a variety of different types of ACOs out there. Hospitals owning physicians is one path. Uh, there are a myriad of other paths which seem to be having more um, incentives behind them, or at least growing incentives, in order to, to keep uh, the United States system moving into just one big integrated delivery system. So complicated answer, but um, certainly that is a trend. It has a variety of drivers behind the trend. Uh, 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 accountable care is just one of the drivers, and there are concerns expressed on the Hill, I know, as well as from private payers, about that trend continuing. Thank you. Sure. We do have another question in the queue. We'll go to Dr. Ann Salto. Hello. Yes, hello. Thank you. I think you partially it on the last one. Um, I'm a PhD prepared registered nurse um, and teach graduate nursing in uh, various areas. And um, here in Colorado, there's a, a big trend, uh, as the previous person stated, toward physicians' um, practices being pulled into large uh, hospital based. Healthcare system. Correct. That is that the national makes, trend. Right, and I um, remember, you know, the '80s. I was part of all that consulting nationally, partially for HBOC, McKesson, and so forth. But it seems to me that where the governance is and where it is, they have the equal um, investments in it. Is most likely to succeed. The fragmentation of coordinated care is extremely obvious to me as I work with other nurses in family, friends, and so forth. Um, they, the lack of coordination of care has been tried in various reasons with Tom Scully back for a pay for performance that there are mm -hmm. in some coordinated care demonstrations. I was a health policy scholar at CMS a few years ago. So um, you stated that that's not a trend that is necessarily encouraged by the government, that there, you know, anybody can do an accountable care organization. So, so we, we, we uh, kind of I, think I, I think I know where you're heading, but, you know, there there is this trend which is accelerating hospitals buying practices. There is okay. concern raised serious concern about that trend continuing to accelerate raised by payers, including the federal government as well as private payers, and many health policy experts. Not that, that, that what's happened to date is necessarily a bad thing, but uh, the one size fits all of provider consolidation, I'm using provider mean hospital plus physicians plus anybody, is, is, is of concern toward getting a more, getting the unique needs of each community met. So there is concern about that trend continuing or accelerating in the sense that it's felt that and each community may different, need different models to best serve that community. 
Well, I've been all over the country, and it seems to me that model would work, uh, at least theoretically. And, you know, I, I don't know, do you know what their concerns are, other than it wouldn't meet the needs of the community, because care is care. Um, it plays out different in the South, where I just came from a couple of years ago with um, various needs, but diseases uh, play out similarly no matter where you're at. I, I think... I think the idea that in, uh, integrated delivery system, right, where it's all part of the same entity like Kaiser, is a fascinating one that many people applaud. The concern about provider consolidation, right, uh, going on nationally, hospitals buying practices, is that of price control. In other words, we still will operate in a free market. Uh, the Affordable Care Act actually leveraged the free market approach, and that if um, if providers rapidly acquire each other, then that puts them in the position of being able to freeze or leverage uh, prices, and um, and that cost could actually go up, not down. And that's where the concern has been raised. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't gone quite to that, although I do have an MBA, but I'm, I'm more careful because and that sometimes comes later. But um, That's right. And we still have a fee-for-service system, so, you know, being able to have market dominance puts you in a position to, to leverage that market dominance, and that's where the concern has been raised. Well, I guess they could make adjustments for that based on cost of living, et cetera, in various areas. Well, you know, your questions are quite astute, and I appreciate them. And um, you, you, um, you know, you might you might be interested, like many people who are interested in health policy and the rapid changes and perspectives that are being uh, uh, leveraged about it, is subscribing to a, a journal called Health Affairs, uh, which. Uh, has become much more readable to the general public like you and I uh, as opposed to just health policy wonks. And it's a wonderful journal. It's, it's pretty affordable. Uh, comes out in hard print as well as online. And it has some of the top policy experts debating these various issues of how to deliver home health services to whether hospitals should be acquiring practices more than they have, to price dominance and all those things. So uh, a wonderful reference if you're interested in following the market as the market changes. Is that written by what group? Health it Affairs. Just go, uh, it's, it's written by a private nonprofit foundation in Washington. But if you oh. um, just go Health Affairs in a Google, you'll find it right away. It's the leading oh. health policy journal in the country. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Very good uh, presentation. It, it helps focus in on, I think, the uh, important point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. We do have one more question in the queue if you'd like to take it. Uh, yes, and this will be the last question, but yes, we'll take this one. And caller, please go ahead. Hello? And ma'am, your line is open. Hello? Well, it looks like our last question may have been the last one, Melanie. Yes, I'll turn the conference back over to you for any closing remarks. Great. Thank you, uh, Melanie. And, and Lisa, do you have a closing remark you'd like to make for the group? Yeah, definitely. I just want to thank Dr. David Nace for leaving the, leaving the webinar today and also for, um, thank everybody that's on the call today. I know we went a little bit over here, but just want to make a quick mention that we did record today's session. 